The microbiome is the collection of organisms that live in and on you. So it's all the microbes that are in your gut, all the microbes that are on your skin, and then on all sorts of other surfaces, things that we used to think were sterile, like urine, turns out it's not sterile, turns out there's microbes in there all the time. And we're discovering that those microbes are playing a critical role in our health. They include bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and usually, you know, we're very microbe phobic. We think microbes bad, right? We think, oh my gosh, I'm going to get giardia and have diarrhea for months or something like that. But we're discovering that the microbes that are in us are actually, they're the good guys. They're in a symbiotic relationship with us. When we feed them and they're happy, then they make all of our health things work really well. And it's cool because we're discovering now um, that the microbe of different microbes of different animals, like our pets, start to be shared with us. So not only do we get to worry about our own microbiome, we get to worry about the microbiome of our children and our pets and all of the things around us because the health of all of those microbial systems then have an impact on our health. Dr. Heather Zwicky, I am so excited to have you on the show. I'm happy to be here. We have known each other a long time. For everyone listening, I <laughs> learned everything there was to know about microbiology and immunology from this woman right here. So it's been several years and I'm super excited to have you on to interview you. And I've been learning all of my women's health and estrogen metabolism from you. <sighs> Oh my gosh, it's like the perfect pairing. Well, today we're going to continue with the sort of microbiology part of the gut because I have been learning a lot about a term I don't think anyone really knows about or talks about called a postbiotic. We've heard about prebiotics and we've heard about actual probiotics, but we're going to dive into postbiotics. Before we do that, though, why don't you give everyone a little intro of who you are, your background, and what you stand for, and then we'll jump into the questions. Sure. I am Heather Zwicky. I'm a PhD immunologist and microbiologist. Um, I did a postdoctoral fellowship and taught first year medical school at Yale University before being recruited to the National University of Natural Medicine to launch a natural medicine research institute. I did that about 20 years ago um, and then launched the School of Graduate Studies at NUNM. And now I have reverted back to teaching adjunct at NUNM, and I'm working for a new company called Thena, which is a microbiome-based company. So I do everything microbiome these days. And the microbiome is, it's ex the idea of it and the research behind it is just exploding. It is hot. It yeah. is hot. Yeah. It's crazy to think that about 10 years ago, we discovered what's essentially a new organ system. We had no idea how valuable the microbiome was until 10 years ago. Which is and now crazy. Yeah. And no, it's insane. It's, it's like discovering the stomach. <laughs> it's something so important and everybody is using it all the time and nobody knew it was there. Well, I think actually, the only equivalent that we have is that maybe the endocannabinoid system. We also didn't know that that was as active as it is until very recently. And now we're seeing all sorts of research and lectures and conferences around the endocannabinoid system too, which is indeed so yeah. cool, which just goes to show how much we do know about the body but really, believe it or not, kind of scratching the surface so much we don't know. There is so much we don't know. And I mean, the research that's coming out right now is so exciting um, because it has everything to do with our health, our aging, how long we're going to live. Like these are really critical questions, I think, that people have. So I, yeah. So, okay, let's start at the beginning because <laughs> some people know what the microbiome is and we'll just sort of walk through from the start. Like We'll start with what's a microbiome, but we'll answer the question. What is a prebiotic, a probiotic? We'll just sort of go through. So start at the beginning. If you don't know, explain to people, what is the microbiome? The microbiome is the collection of organisms that live in and on you. So it's all the microbes that are in your gut, all the microbes that are on your skin, and then on all sorts of other surfaces, things that we used to think were sterile, like urine, Turns out it's not sterile. Turns out there's microbes in there all the time. And we're discovering that those microbes are playing a critical role in our health. They include bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa. And usually, you know, 
we're very microbe phobic. We think microbes bad, right? We think, oh my gosh, I'm going to get giardia and have diarrhea for months or something like that. But we're discovering that the microbes that are in us are actually, they're the good guys. They're in a symbiotic relationship with us. When we feed them and they're happy, then they make all of our health things work really well. And it's cool because we're discovering now, um, that the microbe of different microbes of different animals, like our pets, start to be shared with us. So not only do we get to worry about our own microbiome, we get to worry about the microbiome of our children and our pets and all of the things around us because the health of all of those microbial systems then have an impact on our health. And I think when people hear microbiome, let's say the gut microbiome, and I've gotten this feedback, they just think bacteria right? That's just bacteria. Yeah. And you're like, no, no, no viruses, no. Fungi, which is scary for a lot of people, especially right now, yeah. viruses, fungi, protozoa. Can you explain how they come together and yeah, how they got there? <laughs> so we got two different kinds of viruses that are in our gut microbiome. We have the viruses that affect human cells, things like, um, enteric viruses, enteroviruses, and those might be infectious disease. Those are things that we deserve to be afraid of. But the vast majority of viruses that are in our gut are actually viruses that infect bacteria. They're called phage, and they keep the different populations of bacteria in balance. So a lot of times I like to use the example of Yellowstone Park and reintroducing the wolves to Yellowstone Park. And now you've got a predator that can actually kill the overgrowing species of deer and elk and all of those things. So the viruses function like that in our gut. They actually can kill overgrowth of different species of bacteria that are there. The fungus that is in our gut, the, the primary one everybody's heard of, it's called candida. It's yeast, right? And yeast is normal microbiota. It's designed to help us process carbohydrates. It's designed to help us process metals. Like if we're exposed to heavy metals in our environment, yeast will pull those metal metals right out of the food that we eat and essentially do what we call chelation. Um, they take them out of our poop so that they can't hurt us and get them out of our body. I so, oh, go ahead, keep going. It's so really important to have those, those microbes there because they're affecting our health by making sure we don't get metal toxicity. Did you actually, add that? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I have had colleagues say, if you find on some sort of testing, your candida levels are higher, physiologically higher than we'd expect them to be consider metals. And, and then th this is the reason why that instead of immediately thinking, ah, candida bad, kill it. It's like, whoa, why is it high yep. in the first place? Metals exposure might, might be a reason. It might be. And especially, you know, we're in the Pacific Northwest and we inherit a lot of the acid rain from China. And so we're starting to discover things like lead on our kale and our spinach that we grow in the Pacific Northwest. So yeast would naturally then be higher to remove that lead from those, those plants when we eat them. Which is and even then, good to know in the organic farmers, right? Because every week we generally advocate for try to go organic if it can, if it fits in your budget. But it goes to show even if an organic farmer is being as organic as possible, even the organic in your backyard, we do get a lot of rain and then Pacific Northwest, we but we can't control the rain. So if there is, if it's acidic rain, it's going to end up even on your organic foods. It sure is. It sure is. And I don't want anyone to panic about yeah. eating their organic foods because we have the microbes to remove the toxins from those foods. The other uh, type of toxin that's there, or sorry, the other type of microbe that is there um, are uh, protozoa and, um, you know, we always think Giardia, right? You drink from a a clear stream and you get giardia, but there's 21,000 different protozoans, 21,000 different protozoans, and only a few of them are actually toxic. Most of the protozoans that live in us and on us are actually helping keep all those other microbes in balance. So it's this really complex community that is living in us and living on our skin and helping us be healthy. What are things that disrupt all this whole balance? 
What are some things that disrupt the microbiome? And then we'll get into the things we hear about prebiotics, probiotics, et cetera, and go into depth about those. But what are some classic stuff you see? Well, the big one, of course, is antibiotics. Um, So when you take a course of antibiotics, you're not only killing pathogenic microbes, you're also killing healthy, happy microbes. And so that's why a lot of people will develop symptoms of um, dysbiosis. They'll have diarrhea or constipation, post antibiotics, they might have gas, they might have skin disruptions. Um, So antibiotics are a big one, but there are so many others. So think about anything that's going to kill a microbe. So preservatives in your food, they're designed to kill microbes in food. Guess what? You eat those preservatives, they kill the microbes in your gut. Um, If we think about pesticides, pesticides are designed to kill microbes on plants. Again, you eat those foods, if they have pesticides on them, they're gonna kill the microbes in you. Uh, There are a lot of environmental toxins. So things like diesel fumes, air pollution, um, laundry detergent, shampoo and conditioner and those sorts of things that we use as personal care products, if they have chemicals in them that are designed to kill microbes, usually they'll have those chemicals um, to keep the shelf life of the product, right? So commonly it's 2-phenoxyl ethanol and 2-phenoxyl ethanol lets that shampoo last for six months, but that's because it kills all those microbes. Hard thing to remember, of course, is that The pores on your head are the largest pores you have. So when you're putting shampoo on your head, if it's not organic, those chemicals are going right into you and that's killing your microbiome. So lots of different things we think of as killing the microbiome. And especially in the last two years, what about hand sanitizer? Oh God, it's the worst. (laughs) worst. I mean, it's designed to kill microbes, right? And so what we're seeing coming into the clinic, of course, are people who have used so much hand sanitizer that they've completely disrupted the microbiome on their skin. And their skin is not only dry and cracked, it is also rashed and it's in such bad shape because yes, they have destroyed their skin microbiome. I was on a plane uh, the other week flying home from Chicago from a conference and behind me, a woman had sat in the wrong seat. It, when you get on the plane, they hand you little packets of, you know, a, a wipe, you know, like a, exactly. So it was a wipe. She could, you could wipe down your, your seat and your, the tray table and everything. Uh, so anyway, this woman had sat in the wrong seat and the, the man, a man came up and was like, oh, I think you're in the wrong seat. She's like, oh my gosh, you're right. I'm, I'm actually the seat behind. So she stood up and she said, you're in luck. I've sanitized the whole seat. I've used the wipe. And he goes, Oh, great. It's all right though. I trust my body. And I just laughed out loud. I mean, he was like, he's, and the way he said it with that, like, mm-hmm, I, I trust my body. And again, it's in zero disrespect to the pandemic, mm-hmm. but I, I could tell she probably sanitized everything a hundred times over where he probably just judging by his laissez faire comment, wasn't as is um apt to use hand sanitizer every minute and wipe everything down and be you know extra overly cautious and i thought it's such a two different paradigms right one is kill 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 sanitize everything and the other was meh. yeah and you know this goes back to one of the really <clears throat> tenets of immunology and that is that we are designed to be exposed to microbes And we are designed for our immune system to have to respond to microbes and recover at least three or four times a year. So you should be getting sick three or four times a year. One of the things we've seen with the pandemic with everybody wearing masks is nobody got sick. And as a result, like this year's allergy season is worse than ever because that allergy infectious disease balance is completely out of balance at this point. Nobody's been sick. They don't have any of the uh, infectious disease type proteins around. And so everybody's got horrible allergies. Yeah, we, we have to, we have to be exposed to things like that's how our bodies were designed. And then taking it a step further when it, especially when it comes to the gut microbiome, let's start talking about some of these words that people maybe have heard of or familiar of, and what do they do? Like, let's start with a prebiotic. What is a prebiotic and what is it? Yeah. 
So biotic just means living things. So when we think about microbiome, it's just the small living things, right? So prebiotic is the food that feeds a living thing. So every time you feed yourself, you are feeding your microbiome. That is a prebiotic, it is food. But there are particular types of foods that are way better at feeding microbes than other types. So prebiotic foods historically were defined as um, things like psyllium uh, or chicory, and you could buy things like Metamucil as prebiotic. Now we know that different foods are way better prebiotic. So onions, mm. artichoke, bananas, asparagus, all of these foods that have really good fibers in them are good prebiotics. Then we went one step further and we said, well, we know mushrooms and seaweed has really good fiber. I wonder if they're prebiotic. And it turns out that they are. And then we went one step further and we said, well, what about some of the things like um, spices, things that have polyphenols, which are these chemicals that have a lot of flavor and a lot of color. Turns out they're fantastic prebiotics as well. So we now have this whole spectrum of foods that are prebiotic. And when you eat those foods, you should think of you're not only feeding your own cells, you're feeding your microbes. And then the word most everybody's familiar with is a probiotic. That's so right. what's that? What's that? So probiotics were initially defined as live microbes that have a therapeutic health benefit. So probiotic was any live microbe that has a therapeutic health benefit. It could be bacteria, it could be yeast, it could be a virus um, or a fungus, but it had to be alive. Now, the caveat is that we have since discovered most probiotics are not alive by the time you eat them. They are sitting out there on the shelf, they're eating the food that, that the um, researchers or uh, manufacturers put in the bottle, and by the time they reach you, most of them are dead. So probiotics, I think, are going to undergo a definition change because they may not be alive. Doesn't mean that they don't still have a therapeutic benefit, but whether or not they're alive is, is really dependent on the probiotic. Um, big thing with probiotics is that uh, they tend to be two or three species of bacteria or one, of, one species of yeast. And most probiotics are coming from a similar source. So like all the different probiotics companies buy their bacteria from one place. So people get really hung up on brands, like I need this brand of probiotic or that brand of probiotic. The reality is they're mostly the same. Um, <laughs> it's just who's got a better marketing team and maybe a better uh, image team. Um, the other thing to remember with probiotics is that historically when humans developed, um, evolutionarily, we didn't eat bacteria every day in capsules. And we didn't do it every day of every season. And so what we see with probiotics is that if people start taking a probiotic capsule to say, have an effect on their immune system, they usually work for about three months and then they don't work anymore. So if people want to have a consistent effect with a probiotic, you have to change up which probiotics you're using about every three months. I usually suggest seasonally simply because that's an easy way to remember. Change the season, change your probiotic. Now I have a couple of questions on that. One, you said uh, the there's strain or excuse me, species and species is different from strain as yeah. in like on the bottle, people listening might go, well, my bottle has one strain or my bottle says 10 plus strains or my bottle says 30 strains. What does that mean? So, uh, typically probiotics are listed as a genus species. So think lactobacillus casei, that's a genus species. And then there'll be a strain name that's behind it, which is a subset of lactobacillus casei. What we know is that the activity of the bacteria is strain specific. It's not genus specific, species specific, it is strain specific. So not all lactobacillus casei are equivalent to each other. I think about this, I was just talking about a um, really interesting acne study where uh, this is a study out of Korea where they isolated lactobacillus to give it to people who had acne to see if lactobacillus would work. But here's the thing, lactobacillus is not lactobacillus, right? It's lactobacillus rhamnosus and lactobacillus casei and lactobacillus this and that. 
they isolated their lactobacillus from kimchi and the lactobacillus from kimchi actually cleared up acne whereas lactobacillus that was from dairy that was from yogurt didn't do a darn thing so it matters what strain you have because different bacteria have different activity and i think sometimes people say well i take a probiotic that's like saying i take a drug right? Like you have to have specificity or it doesn't mean anything. So we have to be paying attention, not only to the genus species, but also the strain, because that's where we're seeing the activity level. And we're seeing a lot more research and even products around this. Um, oh, I don't actually know, haven't dug, obviously I'm not an expert, like you are to dig into this, but I will see strain specific for, for example, women's health things, yeah. like strain specific for, do you get chronic UTIs or strain specific for women entering into menopause, that hormone shift, you know, these strains yeah. can be really helpful or. Yeah. And as long as you're paying attention to the strain specificity, absolutely. But I also hear people say, well, probiotics don't work for menopause. Well, you can't say that. That's like saying, well, hormones don't work for menopause, right? Like not a hundred percent of probiotics are going to work for anything. Like not a hundred percent of pharmaceuticals are going to work for anything. So you actually have to be really specific on what you're talking about. Oh, this is so good. Okay. Now we've moved on into the word of the day, which is postbiotic. What is a postbiotic? Postbiotics are one of the latest things. So prebiotic is the food you feed the microbe. Probiotic is the live microbe. Postbiotic is what the live microbe poops out when you feed it food. Lovely. So you've got the food that you feed, the microbe, and then what does it produce from that food? It's the metabolites, as it were. And it turns out the microbe itself, it's not healthy it, it, or unhealthy. It's just there. But what it produces is what's causing the biological effect. So we can administer the postbiotic instead of giving you the microbe. Then we don't have to worry about whether the microbe is alive or not, because it's the postbiotic that gives the activity. This is the coolest thing. Yeah. I, I, I knew, I, I guess I, I first heard a postbiotic from you. I was familiar with some, like the idea of the metabolite. Mm -hmm. of the probiotic. Um, but this is a whole subsection of science that is now going to, it's going to explode, explode even more. So what are some examples yeah. of a metabolite? What is, what is the probiotic poop we're talking about? <laughs> so probably the, the best example of a postbiotic are short chain fatty acids. So think about fatty acids as um, fat, right? And there are long chains and there are short chains and short chains just means the number of carbons in the chain. Short chain fatty acids have been shown to decrease inflammation. They make sure that the pH of your gut is the right pH. They kind of keep oxidative stress at bay and oxidative stress is that thing that makes all of our cells age. So if you've got good short chain fatty acids, then you look younger than you may actually be, right? So um, as we think about hey. the aging process, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I usually talk about this and then people are like, you must have a lot of short chain fatty acids. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, so short chain fatty acids are one of the better metabolites in terms of improving all sorts of different things, but there are so many metabolites that the microbes make. And some of them are things like neurotransmitters. So your microbes are making serotonin. In other words, they're con in control of your happiness. 95% of your serotonin made in your gut. That is one of the reasons why people use food to make themselves feel better. Because when you eat certain foods, you produce more serotonin and then you are going to actually be happier. Here's the tricky part of that. Serotonin is made from foods that contain tryptophan. And tryptophan is in things like turkey and chicken and tuna, and meats, right? Most people aren't reaching for meat when they feel sad. No. <laughs> They're reaching for chocolate. <laughs> yes, a hundred, right here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So chocolate is not one, of, it is a polyphenol. And so it does have a prebiotic effect. It's just not the prebiotic that is going to increase serotonin. You're going to get a short-term burst of happiness with the magnesium and chocolate, with chocolate having an effect on your endocannabinoid system. But if you want to have longer term happiness, then you have to go for a protein-based um, food that will feed your serotonin system. 
Mm-hmm. So we have lots of different metabolites and they tend to be things that we've heard of. It's just that we haven't heard of them as a postbiotic. Can we test for these things? Are we Absolutely. testing for them? No, we can test for them. It's expensive. Mm-hmm. It's still expensive because it's relatively new. So whereas the cost of doing stool testing has dropped massively now. Um, Historically, that was pretty high. And then it started to come down as more and more people did it. That's where we are with metabolites right now. You can test for metabolites, but it's still relatively expensive. And there's a site specificity that is important. The metabolites that are in your gut are going to be somewhat different than the metabolites that are on your skin are gonna be different than the metabolites that are in your blood. There's a correlation between them, but we don't yet know exactly what that correlation is. So if we measure the metabolites from your blood and it says, oh, your serotonin is low, you might have perfectly good serotonin levels in your gut, it's just not reaching your blood. And that's a platelet issue, right? Mm -hmm. Platelets pick up the serotonin in your gut and then distribute it over the rest of your body. So we have to think about like where are we measuring those metabolites and how accurate is, is it to where those metabolites need to be? So actually, so testing is a question of mine. A lot of people listening have probably maybe done or have know somebody who's done stool testing they pooped in the cup for science to see what's going on in their microbiome. How accurate is a lot of this testing when looking at things like short chain fatty acids? Well, So one of the things that we can do is we can measure short chain fatty acids against each other. And we know that acetate, propionate, and butyrate are are at a ratio of three, one, one. So you should have three times the amount of acetate as you do propionate and butyrate. And if we go through and we look and we say, oh, this person is way out of balance. They have too little butyrate. They've got plenty of acetate. Like we can look at that. We can look at the ratios and that's going to give us more information than the exact volume of acetate that's present. So what's more important tends to be the ratios of um, the short chain fatty acids, for example, but that's going to be true for other metabolites as well. Like if we look at your serotonin levels, we know that that's going to directly impact your melatonin levels and how well you sleep at night. So again, it, it all goes back to these ratios. And I think just getting total numbers of how much of this do I have and how much of that do I have may not tell us so much. Now, let's say your ratios are a hot mess. You, you've yeah. done, you're looking at your results right now. If you happen to do it, are you, um, maybe you don't do your test results, but like, how do, do these postbiotics relate mm-hmm. to chronic disease, autoimmune, hormone dysfunction, Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, when we think about postbiotics, the source of the postbiotic is very important because you can buy butyrate over the counter right? You can buy a butyrate supplement, but if you just take butyrate, then it's going to throw off those ratios of butyrate, acetate, and propionate because you're all of a sudden going to raise your butyrate without raising your acetate and your propionate, and you've just thrown off everything, right? So the thing to be thinking about when we're delivering a postbiotic is that we're giving those postbiotics in the correct ratios. How do we get that? Most likely we're going to get that from a healthy human, we're going to derive the postbiotic from somebody who already has the right ratios. And if you do that, we have some evidence to suggest that it's like it's training someone who's unhealthy how their microbiome should look. So it's like you're giving a map to an unhealthy microbiome when you give postbiotics. And that's Thanks. largely the concept behind your company, Thena, correct? That's the concept behind Thena, yeah, um, is that there's plenty of people out there whose metabolites are just not in the right ratios. Maybe they were exposed to um, pesticides. Uh, Maybe they were uh, on long-term antibiotics. And where this all came from, of course, is C. diff, Mm -hmm. right? People started developing uh, a C. difficile-based diarrhea, which was antibiotic resistance. And then we gave fecal transplants to replace their microbes because what we discovered is that there was such severe dysbiosis, we had no way to bring those microbes back into balance. But we can do it with metabolites, as it turns out. We can bring the microbes back into balance with metabolites. So that's the theory um, that works here. And 
yeah, it, it's, it's brand new. So there's a <laughs> lot of research to be done, which is exciting for me as a researcher, because now we are starting to see, you know, what are all the directions we can go with it? Are you seeing, besides supplementation, are you seeing particular diets or trends of diets or foods that can be helpful in improving th these ratio outcomes? Absolutely. So um, probably the best research is coming from the American Gut Project, which is in San Diego. This is Rob Knight's group. And this is what we call citizen science. So people can volunteer to donate their poop to citizen science, and they'll do the analysis of the metabolites and the microbes in your poop. And then they start asking you all these questions of what are you eating? How often are you eating it? You know, so they can do a comparison of diet to metabolites. When they do that, the big thing that they discovered, the very first big thing that they discovered was that there's a very strong relationship between having healthy metabolites and eating more than 30 plant-based foods per week. Okay. Okay. This isn't 30 servings. This is diversity. This is having a diversity of the plant-based foods in your diet. So you can't just eat carrots every day and develop really good metabolites. That doesn't work. Um, and a lot of people do that. So mm -hmm. that's why I say that, but um, it is mixing it up. So it's eating beans and vegetables and nuts and spices and all of these different plant-based foods, the more diversity of the prebiotics in your diet, the better the metabolites that come out the other end. That makes sense, right? What goes in affects what comes out. 100%. They did a follow-up study that showed that eating more live foods and fermented foods was the one thing that increased the good metabolites over 30 plant-based foods. So let's say that you're getting 20 plant-based foods, but some of those foods are kombucha and kimchi and sauerkraut. Those sorts of things can actually improve the metabolites on the other end. Now, they grouped people who ate very few fermented foods with people who, um, and compared them to people who ate a whole lot of fermented foods, like seven days a week, and really, really big difference. But I do have to say one thing, the people who are eating very few fermented foods, can you guess the number one fermented food they were eating or drinking as it were? The ferment beer? Yeah. <laughs> Wine and beer, alcohol. <laughs> so they were the low fermented food group and, and it counts. I mean, they are fermented foods, wine and beer, but compared to a kombucha or a sauerkraut, there's no comparison, right? Like having that healthy fiber and those live microbes makes a big difference. Plus the alcohol effect on the microbiome. Absolutely. Well, oh. the alcohol effect is interesting because that's one of the things that affects the yeast levels too, right? Yeah. Because the yeast love alcohol and sugars. So yeah. Yeah. Which a lot of people notice when they drink alcohol, they feel for lack of a better word, and a yeasty, you know, they feel yeah. like some of their, you know, yeast symptoms, especially if they're aware of their yeast symptoms, whether it's skin related or um, even sinus related or, you know, women vaginal related, the yeast stuff yeah. comes. It comes. And that's what they tell women when they have yeast infections is avoid sugar and alcohol because those are the primary foods. But yeah, so, so in terms of having a healthy microbiome, you don't have to take a metabolite, but um, if you're not going to take postbiotics, then think about trying to get 30 plant-based foods into your diet per week and try to eat at least one fermented food, hopefully with live microorganisms every single day. With kombucha, do you worry like a lot of those kombuchas are flavored and sugar and yeah. I mean, they're not. I'm not saying drink a whole bottle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I think that um, I stay with one of my friends when I'm in Portland and we usually have like a little bit, like a shot of like a shot. Yeah. Cause it's way too much sugar. Um, if you're going to drink a whole bottle of kombucha plus yeah. it's expensive. It is expensive and only going up, unfortunately, only yeah. going up. Well, this is good. Cause bef right before this, uh, this interview, I, ha I have a mix. It's called krauchy. So it's sauerkraut and kimchi and it's a mix in a glass jar. And so 
That's one of my, I love kimchi. It's one of my favorite things. And so it's a, it's a nice mix together. If you like that kind of stuff. I can't do it. I'm rosacea as you can oh, tell. Yeah. Right? And so any spice and I just go bright red. Um, but you know, it's so interesting because I can do kombucha and I can do kavita and, um, those sorts of things I can have, and I don't turn red. Whereas if I eat sauerkraut or kimchi, oh my Lord, not yeah. good, not, not good. good. Oh so my gosh. I think that that's an important part though. And it's interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine last night, who's a physician and we were talking about diets and um, specifically lectins and whether or not people should be eating lectins or not eating lectins. And he pointed out something so obvious that I think we forget sometimes. And that is that not everybody should be able to eat every food, right? Yes. Based off your genetics and your microbiome, you're not going to be able to eat everything. So figure out what works for you and then eat that. And let's not expect that everyone can eat every food healthily and right. we'll do better. And the counter to that too, is that one person Lectins is a great example, not to pick on, pick on lectins, but there's entire books about going to lectin, like everybody, right? It's, it's yeah. E for everyone to be an electin free diet. It's like, hold on. Not every diet, not every dietary suggestion is for everyone either. Just because it worked for you, like sauerkraut and kimchi work for me, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. But imagine I create a book and lecture to the world about going on a sauerkraut kimchi diet, but you're the opposite. You're the expert out there going, don't do sauerkraut and kimchi because it doesn't work. Yeah. We're very individual. So it's the same for all of these dietary suggestions out there, I think. I think it's one of the things that we've lost in Western medicine. If we look at some of the ancient medicines like Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, where they actually look at people's dosha or mm -hmm. their, their type, then they make decisions based off of that. And we've moved to kind of this one size fits all. We're about to rebound from that as we lean towards precision medicine. Yeah. 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 And it's, I, I understand the frustration when people say, well, what's the best diet? What's the best diet for me? Or what's the best diet for, you know, whatever insert X condition, um, or X symptoms. And every time I'm like, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, we <laughs> don't come right. with a manual. We don't come with a book, you. What what works for me may not work for you. Um, we, we come from different ethnicities and different genetics and just, you know, different microbiome and different upbringing and thing. And even on social media, it's, which, you know, love it or hate it, you do get immediate feedback. So, you know, there's even people where you post about a food you would think is pretty non-reactive and a lot of folks, blueberries, right? I'm like, oh, blueberries yeah. are my favorite. And there's absolutely people in the DMs, like blueberries make me break out. I'm allergic to blueberries. You know, blueberries give me diarrhea. I'm like, okay, then <laughs> don't eat them. <laughs> well, that's why I say carrots. I'm like, oh, everybody can do carrots. And, you know, I learned when I was working on this skin podcast, um, people with psoriasis, mm -hmm. carrots makes their psoriasis worse. I had it's no idea. Turns out that there's a number of studies now that show that carrots can actually exacerbate psoriasis. I don't know why. What? You're a biochemist. Tell me why. Yeah, Tell I me why, what? biochemist. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. my goodness. What's funny is I have the enzyme where I struggle to convert beta carotene into vitamin A. So taking beta carotene in the supplement or, you know, getting big beta carotene in food, that's great. But for me to get the, to take it to the next level and actually get the vitamin A out of it. I actually have to take vitamin A. And so, uh, but I don't have psoriasis. So I wonder with the psoriasis folk, what it is about carrot itself, especially because I recommend carrots all the time mm -hmm. for the fiber on the wall, the, the cell wall of the carrot, and then the inside of the carrot, uh, for estrogen, for helping with elimination. Yeah. But well, if you have psoriasis now, now I know I'm going to say, don't do it. Well, and it's, it's 40% of people with psoriasis. So it's not a hundred percent, but it's something to experiment with. If people are experiencing skin lesions, try eliminating carrots and see if that helps, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's that, that whole thing that something we think is innocuous as a carrot could actually still have an effect on certain people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, and this leads me to my next question, which I'm seeing some really interesting pushback, um, that the idea of microbiome testing or the efficacy of giving, giving, you know, prebiotics or postbiotics just doesn't work. You know, like I've seen, I've been in conferences lately where they've brought in experts who were like, no, no, I don't believe in microbiome testing at all. 
no, no, I don't agree with giving probiotics. It doesn't work. Despite even just if you look at the anecdotal evidence, let alone the actual evidence out there, like the number of people that blow up the comments that are like, I, my life has changed since getting microbiome testing, learning what's going on with me, adjusting accordingly, or people who are like, I started X, Y, Z probiotic and, you know, found world of difference. What do you mean they don't work? And what do you, how do you feel about that? So I think that there's a couple of different things. Um, one, I think that, uh, people assume that probiotics are going to replace bacteria that might be bad in someone's gut. That is not what probiotics do. If we look at the clinical trials on probiotics, and I actually have my students doing this this week, so I've got a thousand clinical trials to review right now because my students are collecting all the clinical trials that came out in a couple of years on probiotics, we see that they have a significant impact on the immune system. Um, we see that they're modulating different cytokines, uh, which are the proteins of the immune system that are kind of like hormones. And so we see effects on allergies, we see effects on infectious disease, on autoimmune disease, um, food hypersensitivities, effects on the immune system for sure. Now, if you say, are probiotics the end all be all for folks who have had antibiotics? That doesn't appear to be the case. For some people, probiotics actually might help the, um, the symptoms following antibiotics, but for other people, they don't. And I think this goes back to that whole thing of a probiotic is not a probiotic is not a probiotic. It depends on which pro probiotic someone is taking and what their microbiome was before they took the antibiotic and what their microbiome is after the antibiotic. And then you have to look at what are the metabolites that that probiotic is making and is it replacing what was destroyed? And nobody's looking at that. They're just giving a random probiotic to somebody after antibiotics and then say, oh, doesn't work. Yeah, that's like me saying, oh, take aspirin after, probi after you had your antibiotics. Oh, doesn't work. You know, like it's, it's that piece of like, you can't just say, take a probiotic. We have to be more specific than that. So I think that's part of the issue. And then I've forgotten the second part of the question, but I had an answer for it. Oh, around the push, the pushback of the microbiome testing and, and probiotics. Oh, and the testing. Yeah. So now the problem is that we have all this testing that we can do, but we don't know what it means. Yeah. We know there are three basic enterotypes, three basic, well, in 2011, they just find three basic enterotype, an enterotype that was more bacteroides based, an enterotype that was more prevotella based, and an enterotype that was ruminococcus based. And then about three years ago, 2018, I guess that's four years ago, they decided to combine ruminococcus and prevotella. And well, let's put it this way. Some scientists decided we should combine ruminococcus and prevotella. Um, because one is more sugar-based and the other is more carb-based, like what your diet is on why you would have that enterotype, whereas the Bacteroides is a more meat-based diet enterotype. And other people disagree on whether we should combine them or not. But what your enterotype is tells us a little bit about what is dominant in your diet, but it doesn't tell us what are the 400,000 species that should be in your gut. So now you get this list of microbes that are in your gut and you say, oh, wow, I have acromancia. I should be skinny because people with acromancia are skinny. Well, guess what? There are plenty of people who have acromancia who are not skinny. So what does it mean? Or we say, oh, you have lots of Prevotella. And there are studies out of Europe that say that Prevotella is protective for Parkinson's. But there are studies in the United States that say Prevotella causes Parkinson's. So what does it mean? And that's the reason that we say right now, paying an expensive test, paying for that, when we don't know what all those microbes mean yet, might just be defeating the purpose. Like people now have all this information, but nothing to do with it. Right. Right. And, and also to, to be wary of really wonderful funded marketing companies who are jumping on a research title. Acromancy is a great example. Um, and now that we've said the word acromancia, you're going to see all of your ads and social media pop up to be products right. that contain acromancia. 
And it's the weight loss. So now you're going to start seeing necromancy as the weight loss probiotic, because as you said, it, in theory, <laughs> idea to control system, necromancy is supposed to be the one for normal right. body weight. But if you think that taking one microbe is going to cause weight loss, you're being pretty naive. A one microbe amount 400,000 is causing weight loss. Mm -mm. Yeah. You know, like it's just not going to work that way. It's great marketing, as you say, but, and there is scientific evidence behind it. The scientific evidence came from mice where we transferred acromancia from a skinny mouse into a fat mouse and the fat mouse lost weight. But what is the, what do the mice eat? Purina mouse chow. Yeah. Do they eat McDonald's? No. Do they eat Hostess Ho-Hos? No. Do they drink Coca-Cola? No. So like it was such a controlled system that when we now apply this to the complexity of our diets, it doesn't work that way. And it's the same with all the probiotics. Cause I know people are listening to this thinking, well, what's the best pro what's the best probiotic out there? And hopefully by now you've realized it's definitely not one size fits all. There are not. types and there's obviously, you know, so, like I said, in the beginning, there's some that have 10 plus strains or 30 plus strains. There's soil-based probiotics. There's this based probiotic, but it's not one ring to rule them all. That's right. And furthermore, as I stated earlier, if you want to make sure that you're going to get a continuous effect, then you need to change the probiotic every three months. And you're going to find that there are probiotics that give you terrible gas. Mm -hmm. And so you change to that one and you're like, whoa, I should go back to my old one because this one gives me gas. There are hundreds of probiotics. There are thousands of probiotics out there. Just because that one gives you gas, it's actually not the microbes that are giving you gas. It's the prebiotic that's in the bottle with the microbes that give gas. And so change to a probiotic that doesn't have a prebiotic. But again, if you don't know what that particular microorganism does, it's like taking a random drug. Yeah. Yeah. So we like probiotics. I like probiotics. Yeah. And prebiotics, I right? Like I, I definitely, um, people have absolutely, my patients over the years have gotten a lot of benefit from them, but it's the age old question. What's the, what's the best diet? What's the best probiotic? I'm like, well, yeah. I think that one of the reasons people are getting benefit from probiotics is one of the species of microbes that pesticides like to wipe out is lactobacillus. Uh. And so a lot of times, if you're not eating an organic diet, one of the things that's happening is you're killing your own lactobacillus. And every time you take a probiotic, you have that lactobacillus for that day. It doesn't stay there. Mm -hmm. You have to take it again tomorrow, but at least you have lactobacillus that day. And that, I mean, it's just a theory, but it tends to be a pretty solid theory. And that if we look at people who are exposed to pesticides, their lactobacillus, sometimes their bifidobacterium tends to be pretty low. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in those probiotics. Oh, this is so fascinating. This is so fascinating. All right. So as we wrap this up, given that this is the root cause medicine podcast, and we have been talking all about the gut microbiome metabolites, postbiotics, what are the top two or three things that you want to leave everybody with that can be somewhat tactical and, and what that you like, what are the three, two or three things you want everyone to absolutely remember? So the first thing is diversity of diet, mix it up. Don't eat the same thing every day. Um, really mix up the diet and mix it up with plant-based foods. Uh, the second thing would be try making a decision at least once a month for something that you think could be killing your microbes and changing products to something that doesn't kill your microbes. So whether that's deciding to um, purchase a cleanser that may not be as severe um, or organic or something like that, or it's um, deciding um, you're going to do a week without breathing any diesel fumes. And so you're, you know, going to wear a mask when you ride your bike or whatever it is, but make a decision of one thing that you can do to protect those microbes instead of, um, killing them. And then the last thing is something we haven't talked about, but it's super important for your microbiome. And that is hug and kiss a pet. Yes. You know, that's a favorite of mine. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you. Just give that dog a big kiss. It licks you, lick it back. And uh, 
And that's one of the best things you can do for your microbiome. In fact, there's been research at a University of Colorado um, Health Sciences Center showing that kids with asthma um, have way fewer asthma attacks if they get a pet. So get that pet and let it feed your microbiome. I love that. I always say uh, pet a dog because, but I'm going from a hormone aspect, which is increase your oxytocin, right? Your feel good yeah. hormone. But uh, oh, obviously, we get a twofer. We get a twofer. Pet, yes, yes. And I always, I always, I'm like, make sure you're not allergic to the pet and it's not an aggressive pet, but pick your pet and, and, and love on it. Let it love on you. Snakes aren't the best. Snake arts, yeah, probably. Snakes aren't the best. Fish aren't the best. It usually has to be a furry pet. But- <laughs> But we think the reason it has to be a furry pet is that furry pets groom themselves. And when they're licking their fur, they're transferring their microbiota to their fur. And so then when we pet them, we pick up that, those microbes. So yeah, I, a hamster. I love that. Maybe a hamster. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) All right. So tell everyone where they can find you. Tell actually, let's start with, tell everyone about Thana, because this is a brand new concept of your company and it's so fascinating. Yeah. So, um, Thana is a microbiome-based company. It is a complex metabolite mixture and uh, people take it for everything um, from autoimmune disease to neurological issues and depression and that sort of stuff to um, aging. Um, they take it for all sorts of different reasons. It, it requires a prescription, but you can get a prescription on the website. The website is Thana.com, T-H-A-E-N-A. A E N A dot com. Okay. A lot of people forget that E. Um, and I provide all the medical education. So if you go to the blog, if you go to the podcast, if you go to um, some of the courses that are available, that's me. Uh, so that's a good way to find me. Another way to find me is my own website, which is just heatherswiki.com or my Instagram. Um, and my professional Instagram is at hswiki which we will have all of that linked in the show notes below. And I highly recommend uh, going to Thana.com because their blog, I read all through the blog over this last week, preparing for this interview, even though I've known Heather for a long time, um, the concept of metabolites, I really wanted to make sure I understand so I could ask her all the questions and it's a wealth of information and you don't have to be a practitioner to understand it. She writes it really easily to understand for yourself and your family and and, and what's going on and, and just a, a cool look at gut health versus maybe what you're used to. Thanks. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the root cause medicine podcast, Heather. I am just beyond excited to have you on here. Cause I think the world of you and I'm love being able to just talk to you about all of this and pick your brain and get it out to the world. Thanks. I think everybody realizes at this point that we have this mutual love and respect for each other. <laughs> I think the world of you too. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks again. And uh, we'll talk soon.